Ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to this uh, session as part of the uh, formal program now of this uh, World Economic Forum meeting on the Middle East, North Africa, and Eurasia, where we're going to be focused on the very timely topic of the future of European integration. Um, we obviously could not have a more interesting time to be able to hold this discussion. Um, we have as a theme of the overall WEF meeting uh, the concept of bridging regions in transformation. Uh, and I think that uh, the EU stands inevitably at the face of its own transformation. Um, it has been the world's leading example of regional integration for over 50 years now. Um, but where it will be in the next 20, 30 years probably depends upon how it handles the particular crisis uh, that is befalling it right now in the context of uh, the euro, but potentially one that's going to spill over into many other political dimensions uh, of the process of European integration. You could say that actually European integration took place in a relatively benign uh, global and economic context for its first 50 years. The EU countries were at the top of the global economic ladder, um, but now the kind of structural challenges that have been eating away at its competitiveness for a long time, uh, whether demographic, uh, whether in terms of ability to integrate immigration, whether divergences in competitiveness, in educational attainment levels, in the build-up of government debt, all of those structural challenges have coincided with the rise of uh, other countries' economic competitiveness with a rise of the rest, as some have described it, and these have exposed the EU's vulnerabilities. Um, we have five super panelists, four right now, but shortly I am told to be five, uh, very good panelists who are going to uh, tackle this topic, um, representing in essence two of the EU's most strategic neighbors, one of which, in the case of Turkey, is in the midst of accession negotiations, and then three EU views, if I can call them that, each from a different perspective, one political, uh, one business, um, and one from one of the uh, more thoughtful commentators on European integration. Uh, Ekmen Baj is the Minister for EU Affairs and the Chief uh, Negotiator uh, for the EU accession processes for Turkey. Uh, Vittorio Grilli is Vice Minister of Economy and Finance of Italy. Daniel Gross is the uh, director of the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels. Sir Michael Rake is chairman of BT Group, uh, amongst other positions that he holds, both non-executive and, ex and uh, well, principally non-executive these days, Mike, yes. Um, and then we will be joined uh, by President Viktor Yanukovych uh, of Ukraine. Um, so let me start off by giving an opportunity to each of our speakers to uh, tackle perhaps one dimension of this uh, process of European integration and how, to start with Minister Baj, if I may with you, how the EU looks somewhat from somebody who's in the midst of a negotiation, a little bit still on the outside uh, rather than on the inside. Um, you could argue that the EU's relationship uh, with Turkey has become hostage to developments within the EU rather than hostage to anything that may or may not be happening in Turkey in terms of its ability to meet the kind of uh, negotiating criteria, the acquis communautaire as it's called, um, and that uh, at the moment, whatever you do, it's going to be very hard to take the process forward. Is this the way you see it? When you look at Europe right now, do you see a part of the world that is closing in on itself? Or do you see a European Union that is still able to think strategically about its future, in particular, its relationship with Turkey? Well, we had a similar discussion back in January in Davos. And I couldn't help myself. And I told the leaders around the table, European Union government representatives, cheer up. We have seen worse, and you have seen worse. You overcame your difficulties, so did we. This is going to be over. Unfortunately, we're in the process of trying to get it over with. But no crisis lasts forever. This crisis would be over too. And we should not forget that per capita prosperity is still the highest in Europe compared to the rest of the world. And when I say per capita prosperity, I'm talking about not only income, but income plus human rights, plus food safety, plus hygiene standards, plus 
hopes for future European Union has a set of values which unite us, and those are the right values to carry on to the next generation. I always argue in my own country that EU is like our dietitian. <laughs> Everyone knows they have to watch what they eat and they need to exercise regularly to lead a healthy life, but sometimes they tend to forget doing the right thing. And sometimes you need the advice of a coach, a motivator, a doctor, a dietitian to do the right thing. 27 countries, those of them especially who implemented the EU rules and regulations, became more prosperous, more transparent, more dynamic, and EU itself is a peace project. If the Brits and the French can live together under the same umbrella despite centuries-long wars in their common history, it's because of EU. I used to joke with my French counterparts and say, so you can digest to live with the Brits in the same union and not with us? What's wrong with you? Because <laughs> none of the wars we had in our history were as bloody as the wars among themselves. So this is going to be over. And by the time the crisis is over, we all have to be prepared. Yes, it is difficult. Turkey's membership aspirations have been hijacked by political ambiguities within Europe. Unfortunately, we see more and more politicians in Europe who try to exploit Turkey's membership aspirations for their domestic campaigns. But some of the things we have done in Turkey in the last couple of years are amazing, and we did it with the EU push. In a country where people would be afraid to admit they were Kurds, we now have 24 hours of Kurdish broadcasting on state television. The Armenian community started having masses at the religious Akdamar church, which is one of their oldest churches in the world, after a gap of 88 years. The Orthodox community have started enjoying Sumala Monastery after 112 years. People of Roma origin have enjoyed greater freedoms. Our food standards have increased. We now have rules about the toys that our kids play with. The baby food manufactured in Turkey, welcome Mr. President, is all organic now thanks to EU rules and regulations. So what we try to express is it's not the rules of EU that created the problem. It's the fact that some members did not comply with their own prescription. The fact that the dietitian himself is overweight, is moody, has a few clogged arteries, doesn't make the prescription bad. The prescription is still the best around, and we have to focus on the process, on the prescription, not the dietitian, not his mood, not what's happening domestically, and this can be resolved. Well, uh, it sounds like we have to go outside the EU to get some cheerleading for the EU. Um, so thank you very much for reminding us about some of the strong uh, attributes which the EU still possesses, both intrinsically and uh, from your perspective. Um, but let me turn to one of the countries that is uh, certainly taking on the diet with renewed vig uh, vigor, uh, Vitor Grilli, um, uh, Vice Minister for Economy and Finance uh, in Italy. Um, uh, clearly, Italy is a country that right now is having to think very differently about its relationship with the EU. I think uncharitably, one might say uh, it was a country that it, it would appear from the outside kind of coasted, uh, uh, went a little easy perhaps on undertaking some of the structural reforms that membership within a single currency might imply, and which is now uh, on, on a crash course, if I'm gonna keep going with the metaphor that Mr. Minister Baj started with, a, a crash diet uh, in trying to get itself broadly competitive, there have always been competitive parts to Italy, but to get its economy as a whole into a much stronger shape. Um, how ready do you think the Italian people, Italian political parties are for some of the really tough choices that are going to have to be taken, not just in six months, but over the next two to three years of, of constant tightening of the belt? Well, um, I think they are ready and they understand the challenge. Um, that is, in fact, uh, the whole uh, idea and purpose of uh, uh, this government, the Monti government, uh, to um, do in a rush, uh, as you said, uh, with a, a crash uh, course in reform, uh, 
what uh, has been uh, following a slow pace, uh, given the challenges the global economy uh, is providing uh, to us and Europe in general. Uh, and uh, I think the proof uh, is that in the last um, seven months, uh, we introduced a huge amount of reform, and especially in the budget, which is uh, being identified, uh, rightly so, as one of our uh, sort of soft spot, especially our uh, big uh, debt to GDP ratio, um, we introduced a huge uh, tightening of the belt, as you said, uh, to assure that starting next year we'll have a, a balanced budget in structural terms. And we did more because uh, we were among the first uh, to change our constitution. According to the fiscal compact, we introduced uh, uh, the constitutional obligation to have a balanced budget always, forever. Um, and I think Italian understands very well that that's part of uh, a necessary component to set the rules straight so that uh, misbehavior is not allowed in the future any longer and is part of uh, the precondition to keep building Europe as a part of a dynamic uh, 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 economy that is driving uh, the world. And uh, of course, uh, um, that means uh, uh, giving up uh, part of um, old habits or maybe sovereignty, depends how you want to call it. Uh, but uh, it, they see as uh, there is no way uh, other than uh, having common standard, common rules, and a clearly identifiable framework to move forward. Uh, which move forward means uh, to build together the next step, which means uh, looking at a common, better managed budget. Uh, maybe common is a big world, but at least uh, to have a much better uh, uh, understanding of, for example, a common area like research and development, infrastructural project, things that we all know that are part of uh, increasing our potential output, uh, our potential output, of course, uh, and uh, uh, looking with uh, uh, a different, different eyes, uh, also not just at the fiscal policy as part of uh, uh, discipline, but also fiscal policy as part of a component of a growing economy. But Mr. Gulli, I, I can maybe come back to this point in a minute, because I think it'd be fair to say that, yes, Italy carries a large debt. On the other hand, you have a really relatively low deficit. Uh, a lot of your debt is held by Italians. Um, there are very strong private savings. I think that the challenge of growth seems to be the one where the markets are most doubtful. And let me just bring in, uh, in a minute, we will welcome President Yanukovych of Ukraine. Let me just say that very quickly. Delighted to have you with us. I will just go through two of the other panelists and then come to you maybe at the end to let you uh, reflect on some of the comments others have made. Uh, let me just segue from this point to, to Michael Rake. Um, uh, Mike, as, as somebody who's uh, obviously led companies um, in uh, the EU and, and chairman right now of BT Group, the, the big promise of, of European integration was that it would help deliver more efficiently growth across a group of disparate countries which by themselves would be too small uh, to be able to survive. I mean, do you, when you look at the European Union today, do you see it as capable of delivering growth? Are the regulations, the way they're designed, is the, the, the structure of decision making actually holding Europe back? or is it actually going to give it the opportunity to move forward? And I think of the services market in particular, where we've not had much progress yet in opening that up. What do you think? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, firstly, you know, I think that what was said earlier, we need to remember in all of this discussion, Europe overall has been a huge success, nearly 70 years of peace, and until recently growth, and the creation of a very large market. So, I mean, we, we need to remember that. And despite the fact that I'm British, I should declare right up front that from the beginning I've been pro-European Union, and actually I may be the last one left, but I'm still pro-Euro, so <laughs> I have to be careful what I say. But no, from a business perspective, obviously that was the opportunity. The frustrations are really the following, I think, is that we have not created, uh, finished the single market quickly enough. Uh, this has been used by some major countries, in our view and business's view, as a form of protectionism. So we haven't seen services, telecoms, and other areas advance quickly enough that would allow growth to occur. In some cases, I don't think there's been enough movement quickly enough to flexibility of labor, to follow some of the reforms that were necessary that Germany enacted so successfully. I think there's been too much intellectual discussion. You'd expect a business to say that, you know, we focus too much on 
the Lisbon Treaty versus the Lisbon Agenda. The Lisbon Agenda, I can't remember, it was 12, 13 years ago now. That was exactly to the point of competitiveness of how in a high cost environment with the kind of level of social security that we do want to maintain for our citizens, we remain competitive and use technology to do so. And we spent too much time on, as I say, the treaty versus the agenda that I think is very important. And I think, you know, if we look uh, also at something else that frustrates business, although we watched it happening, and it's been referred to and this comes back into the future, is the failure to uh, obey the rules of Maastricht. You know, and again, there was a, a lack of leadership by example by big countries who were the first to break the rules, which of course encouraged small countries who thought this is a very good free lunch. You know, we can eat at this table very easily and we can break all the rules. Comes back to the dietitians and suddenly the music stopped uh, and now we face this crisis. Uh, and I think also, you, you, know, you, you know, one sense, and I'm not an economist, is to some extent some of the smaller countries were brought in for political rather than economic purposes. So that's the sort of summary of, of this, a lot of good that's happened, but there's a lot of things that have not been focused in the right way fast enough to deal with the fact that Europe was going to be always a high cost economy in that sense, mm. facing, and we've known that for a very long time, huge competition from the south and from the east, you, you know, in a, in a globalized economy. And I think coming to your point, uh, I think it is very, very difficult, and we all understand that, for politicians to deal with this. It requires huge courage to say the truth, to say it very clearly, and then to follow up on it. And we see politicians under huge pressure. But I think, unfortunately, the misleading, uh, you know, the errors of the past, if you will, by successive governments in successive countries, and I don't exclude the UK from this, by the way, in our, we've made lots of mistakes, uh, mean that this requires huge level of leadership now to bring this together, and notwithstanding all crises end, but this has to, there really has to be leadership about agreeing what it means to be in the Eurozone, what are the disciplines and how are they enforced, and I think that unless this happens and we get clarity around that, there is no confidence at the moment. Mm -hmm. Businesses have cash, but they're not investing mm -hmm. because they don't know the environment they're going to be investing in. And that hits jobs, it hits youth unemployment, which is a huge issue for all of us. And it's unsustainable to have these high levels of youth unemployment. Therefore, there's a real urgency to deal with this, to get the confidence back, to allow businesses, and particularly SMEs, to invest. And my last point, very quickly, because it's, it's very badly misunderstood, uh, deliberately probably by the press and many commentators, is, is the whole financial uh, regulation sector needs to be, we need to be really clear about a level playing field. We need to be really clear about what levels of capital liquidity are necessary and the implications of certain states, certain countries, including the UK, taking positions which could be hugely damaging uh, from, from a, you know, a, a, an economic point. In other words, getting the balance right on financial regulation is a hugely important issue that politicians are going to have to get their minds around. So, so whereas our regulatory environment has been part of what's made us attractive, to go back to Ahmed Baj's open, opening comments, the danger is that still in particular areas we may end up over-regulating or regulating right. to a European Correct. standard that, uh, that detaches us from the rest of, of the community. Let me turn now to Daniel Gross, um, uh, head of, of SEPS uh, in, in Brussels. Uh, Daniel, one could make the comment that there are in a way, two tiers of European countries right now. Maybe they meet somewhere in the middle. But the, those that have become structurally competitive or have remained so over the last five to ten years and those that are on a crash course to try and do it now, there surely is a risk that these two groups cannot be brought together fast enough uh, at the kind of pace that the markets seem to be demanding and certainly that membership of a single currency demands. There was a, a survey done uh, by the Voice of Europe on behalf of the World Economic Forum's uh, Remodeling Europe initiative where uh, the participants, and I think these were fairly uh, uh, EU knowledgeable group, but 61% of them expected a multi-speed Europe uh, to have emerged uh, with a kind of more federated core and a less integrated periphery um, in the coming years. I mean, do you think that's the inevitable outcome of where we are today, that it's just been impossible to hold Europe together at a 27 or a 30 or 32 over these coming years? Europe has always tried to do the impossible. 
<laughs> keep 27 member countries together with very different uh, starting points and aspirations. Of course, within the euro area, we have this north-south divide, which is not new. Ten years ago, we had exactly the same thing with the opposite sign. There was a famous cover of The Economist ten years ago, which said Germany, uh, I don't know, the sleeping, uh, not the sleeping giant, but the, an economy which can't get it itself to move again. Um, and then certain reforms were done, certain adjustment pre uh, mechanisms worked, and then ten years later, now, Everybody exaggerates, I think, in the other direction. Germany is not as strong as it appears, and the others are not as weak as they appear. But as you said, the adjustment is working. Costs are falling in the periphery, increasing in Germany. And if the other countries had 10 years to adapt, like Germany had, then I think we could just sit back and say, let's wait it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we can't, <laughs> because the financial markets don't give us the time. And that is the nature of the crisis right now. We need to have a bridge towards this future which we can see coming, but which we need to finance. And I think that is what also the, the, the people are expecting. Uh, they are feeling there is this crisis in the air, and uh, they have lost faith in the leadership of the people and sometimes of the institutions. But if you look more closely, actually, they have not lost faith in the project overall. As a matter of fact, the support for the EU remains strong almost everywhere not necessarily support for EU institutions, right, which let us think what they're doing. Uh, support for the euro, for example, remains strong, very strong in Germany and Northern Europe in general, contrary to what many people expect. And therefore, I think politicians also perceive everywhere that there is a project which people want to preserve. They're willing to make sacrifices, as we heard also in Italy. Even in Germany, people say, we want to keep this thing going, just do it and uh, they have to find a way to do it. Now, we have seen so far, they always do it at the last minute, uh, when there's absolutely no other way around. And uh, I think in that sense, uh, your motto here of cheer up uh, might be useful. Uh, this crisis is, I think, now finally uh, coming to a breaking point where our leaders are taking the steps uh, which will allow us to go over it. And then it's not all nice and gory, but uh, then at least we know where we are going. Might be very tough 10 years for the countries uh, which have a high debt level, but uh, once the people there know the way and the financial markets know which way things are going, then at least the temperature can cool down a little bit um, and uh, things can proceed. Um. Daniel, thanks, thanks for those comments. Let me turn now, uh, Mr. President, to, to you, President Yanukovych. One of the questions that was highlighted for this panel today was the soft power of the EU. Um, and as I think we know, soft power is meant to be the power of attraction rather than the power of coercion. Um, and I'm just wondering, how does this look? How does this conversation, where we're talking about the EU and the uncertainties about its future, um, is the EU as attractive? Does it have the ability to make a country like Ukraine want to rethink uh, particular policies that it, under, that it undertakes in order to be able to gain uh, economic benefits and benefits to its market? Do you think the moral power the power of attraction of the EU is as strong as it was uh, a few years ago. First of all, I would like to greet all the participants of the seminar. I'm very happy to take part in today's discussion. the constructive nature inherent in this meeting and this useful opportunity for a candid exchange of opinions and open talk on common problems is useful for every one of us because the problems that we are talking about are common. Ukraine is not situated on an island. There are also problems in Ukraine related to the crisis, and uh, we have passed 
over the most acute period of the crisis in 2008 and 2009, when the economy of Ukraine and the GDP fell more than 15 percent, the output production fell more than 25 percent. And I should say that that was a heavy blow to our economy and social welfare in the country. Considering this fact, I can say that the economic structure of the country is export-oriented to more than 60 percent of our products we export. As far as 2010 is concerned, it was the year of the initiation of the reforms. We have initiated reforms, and uh, at that time, when in Europe and uh, the world over there was the crisis in place, we have started reforms. These reforms are profound, they are meaningful, and uh, they touch upon, first of all, the economic field. We had to find uh, the recipes to cure the illness. And uh, how we will manage to curb the deficit. It was not less than in Greece. It was about 15 percent. Uh, our experts have been working with all the world organizations, including the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and uh, we understood perfectly well that uh, reducing the social standards for our citizens uh, is impossible. And uh, I absolutely agree with my colleague from the United Kingdom that the dependence of the politicians on the people, on the electorate, on the voters, is huge. And besides, there is an understanding that there should be the social justice. We saw what a gap between the poor and the rich there was and it was necessary to implement the reforms even at that time and uh, to deal with that gap, the huge gap, the pensions, first of all, uh, between the big pensions and small pensions. Uh, so the gap was more than 100 times. And uh, I should say that uh, the pension reform was also at the basis of the program of 2010, we managed to go through this period of time softly, and uh, we raised the pension age both for women and men for the retirement, and uh, it was not an easy road for us. When we looked at the ratings, they were falling down. Uh, when we were implemented the unpopular reforms. And uh, as for the tax reform, it was also difficult enough. The adoption of the tax code, which uh, was not adopted for 20 years in Ukraine, and we had to adopt it, and we did it. The budget code, the customs code, all that work was done. These are huge reforms that we managed to translate into life. Recently, we have adopted the Criminal Procedure Code, which was uh, an embarrassment not only for Ukraine, but also for the international community. One could talk on end on this topic, but without changing the approach, without changing the criminal procedure code that existed in Ukraine since 19th of the 20th century, the way could not be 
gone forward. Uh, this code was not good to live by, and we understood that. And uh, in the end, together with the experts from the Council of Europe, we came up with the criminal procedure code that was adopted after that, and in the nearest time it would take effect. And uh, that is why that uh, we managed to embark on this road. And uh, the road was radical, I can admit. And that was our success when we managed to bridge the deficit. And now for the two years and a half in a row, we have the deficit of 2.5%. We managed to raise the level of economy. And uh, for the two years, uh, Consequently, we uh, managed to secure the increase in the output production by 5.6%. As for the European integration, we understand that it's not only the accession to the elite club. This is the homework, and uh, we uh, understand pretty well that much depends on Ukraine. What? we do and how we will do that, how we will go this way of the European integration. We have uh, worked out a very ambitious project and uh, virtually we have completed it. I mean the preparation of the agreement on association between Ukraine and the European Union, which envisages as a component of the agreement the establishment of the free trade zone. And we understand perfectly well that it is an unpopular decision, the expansion of the European Union at this time. And uh, it slowed down a little bit, not only for Ukraine, but also for Turkey. And in our uh, point of view, that was a decision, mistaken decision, but the pose that exists now will be favorable either for Ukraine or for Europe. And we believe that if Ukraine can go to the Europe now, then Ukraine will have to bring Europe inside. I mean that we will have to have the necessary standards and the harmonized and approximated legislation with the standards of the European Union and the rules that uh, would be attractive for our partners in the world. And we understand it very good that only innovation and investment model for the development of Ukraine will bring us the good prospect and will give us the opportunity to raise the level of economy. And it means the living standards of people and to reduce the gap between the poor and the rich. Thank you so much. For those comments, and as you said, I think structurally, um, Ukraine may have needed to do these steps in any case, but it's interesting the EU itself is now we're both talking about raising uh, pension ages and so on. It'd be interesting to see whether, I don't know whether Ukraine's pension age is higher than uh, some of those in existing parts of the EU. I want to make sure that we have an opportunity to get questions from the floor. So let me turn now and, and invite you to share some questions with us. Please try and make them short uh, and to the point. Um, and do let uh, us know who you are. If you want to address the question to one particular member of the panel, please do so. Uh, otherwise, we'll pass them around. And if we do have questions, we'll take two or three questions in one go. And I've had one person who very, uh, I've seen a couple of hands go up already, so I'm going to take them as I see them. I've seen one question here. Yep. Then please, uh, on there as well. So here first. Did you? Charles Grant from the Centre for European Reform in London. I have a question for President Yanukovych. You mentioned the association agreement with the EU, which would do a lot to open up your economy. The EU is refusing to ratify that because of the situation with Mrs. Timoshenko. Uh, at the same time, Mr. Putin is asking you to join the customs union with Kazakhstan and Belarus. Given that the EU is closing the door to you, shouldn't you perhaps think of turning east, given that I gather Mr. Putin is offering financial incentives to Ukraine if it joins the customs union. Is, is that the way forward? I'll give you a chance to, to get to that question in a minute, uh, President Yanukovych. First, a question down the front row here. And we're going over there, I think. My name is... Yep, you're on, you're on. My name is Hussam Mahmoud. I'm the CEO of Al-Dahla Agricultural Company. 
We work on the security food program of the GCC countries and uh, mainly UAE. Uh, I completely share the enthusiasm of the Turkish part on, uh, in the European Union. And we're looking very actively on acquisitions in the uh, south of uh, Europe to secure the foods for the GCC countries. I would like to, to know what's the point of view of the panelists on this point. Thank you. Great. That's uh, on foreign investment and, and how attractive parts of the EU are looking now for acquisitions and foreign investment, correct? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. And what are the risks? <laughs> no risks. Keep investing. It's good. Um, yeah. Here. Thank you. Ilya Kasich, Teros, Moscow, Russia. Uh, obviously, Europe uh, is now having some hard time trying to figure out an elegant solution uh, to the problems it has right now. However, it still has the absolute authority to adopt new members. And with that regards, the question I have to all the panel is if uh, you consider adopting new members, wouldn't this be considered as a red flag that you want to share the burden that you have with the new members. Thank you. Explain that bit again. There will be a red flag. What do you mean by that? Sorry. <laughs> will this raise any concerns that you actually want to transfer the burden to the newcomers? Okay. Um, I think generally most EU members have worried that actually enlarging adds burdens to the existing members rather than the other way around. But that might be for the for the panel to comment on. Let me take those first three questions and then we'll see if we uh, get a second round. Um, uh, President Yanukovych, you had a very specific question targeted at you. I'll come to you last, if I may, just give a chance to, to talk around these topics uh, in a minute. Um, let's look at this question, first of all, about how attractive Europe remains for foreign investment. It's very interesting. I saw a poll actually by a different group, by a consulting firm recently, which asked US and Chinese business leaders about their thinking about investing in Europe. 6% of US business leaders were planning to invest in the EU. 63% of Chinese business leaders were planning to invest in the EU. That's quite an interesting contrast there. Vittorio Grilli, what, what, how do you see foreign investment as a potential agent or driver of change? Uh, and what are the risks that they face if they take this step? Maybe you could do the positives. I'll let Mike or somebody <laughs> talk about the risks. The real business can <laughs> talk about the negatives. Um, now, of course, the difference between the US and uh, Chinese attitude can be already the fact that uh, US is already in Europe uh, massively and uh, China not yet. Uh, so at the margin, uh, uh, the kind of uh, arguments uh, are different. Uh, of course, Europe, uh, uh, I think, is very attractive still, um, but it has to prove itself, uh, has to prove the case. Uh, right now, in the midst of this uh, volatile uh, financial environment, uh, I think there is a lot of fog uh, that um, doesn't uh, uh, really allow to make a clear, uh, cool-headed uh, uh, judgment in some cases. But I think that uh, going back to some of the points that were made before, uh, really Europe uh, uh, has a lot more to offer in the case, for example, of uh, uh, guaranteeing a true single market, especially in the service sector. And I have to say that right now the boundary between manufacturing and services is becoming more and more blurred. And uh, I think that when uh, a company uh, think of uh, the US market versus uh, the European market, uh, I think one question that I myself heard from some investor around the world is uh, if I go and uh, set up uh, uh, a, a business uh, uh, in Iowa, I'm pretty sure I have a 400 million uh, uh, market uh, to access with no problem. If I set it up, uh, say, in Milan, uh, is there really a 400 million market or 450 or not? And it's true that in Europe there are still uh, barrier. Uh, some are visible, some are less visible, and which segments the market, segments it geographically, segments it uh, from a sectoral point of view, segmented uh, from a gender point of view, segmented from a, a generational point of view. So the view from outside is that it's still complicated compared to other area of the world. And right now, it's not very difficult to find very attractive, dynamic economic area in the world yeah, yeah. Uh, that can make a, a clear, better case. So I think it is up to us uh, to remove this barrier. And I think it's not such a difficult uh, uh, thing to do. 
Mike, did you want to say something on, on foreign investment and risks, perhaps? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, you know, it's obvious that the combination of the failure to deal with some of the issues we talked about in the Lisbon agenda and competitiveness have moved, and the crisis we face, you know, the financial crisis moved from low growth to no growth. It's a simple fact that the vast majority of global investment has shifted, stayed the same in America and the United States, and moved to Asia, Pacific, and emerging markets at the expense of Europe. That's clear that's happened. However, I, you know, I do agree that the Europe has got attractiveness to it. I think it comes back to the question of creating confidence by getting past this immediate crisis. Those who take a longer term view tend to, like the Chinese, tend to see that more clearly. The only other thing I'd add, the only other thing I'd add, Robin, which is quite interesting, is hedge funds you should always watch. I know not everyone likes hedge funds, but <laughs> it's quite interesting that there's a lot of hedge funds really beginning to go for distressed assets. Uh, in Europe and buying them up and, and also buying good assets from distressed banks, of which they're going to be a lot potentially if we're not careful, so as they reduce their balance sheet. So that's an indication that potentially you know, prices are a point where business will start to invest, providing they don't think we're about to go off another cliff, you know, which is confidence. I, you yep. know, I, I kind of think that's the, the, where it is. Thank you. Uh, Edmund Baj, what about this question on enlargement potentially being a a burden, a way of saying, come in, join the EU, and then you'll have to carry the, the load with us, whether on budget, whether on structural funds, or whatever. I mean, do you see things that way, or, or do, you, you know, do you worry that if you get beyond the, the dietitian and have to actually join the practice? Then I think happen? we have to make the distinguishment between joining European Union and joining the Eurozone. Yep. Turkey is in the game of trying to become a member of European Union not necessarily the Eurozone. Although, if you join the EU, you would have to commit to join the Eurozone at some point, I believe, yes? Well, we're following <laughs> this is the a long way. earlier uh, <laughs> candidates, United Kingdom, Sweden, they're still working on it. I mean, we have a long way to go. Yes. We're ready to join the European Union tomorrow. Okay. On the Eurozone, uh, we, we'll have to look at the options. However, I never see the EU as a pure political or an economic union. As I mentioned in my introduction, it's a peace project. And there was a saying by Churchill about the Americans, which is now accurate for the Europeans. Churchill said these Americans always do the right thing after exploiting all the other options. Now we see that in Europe. But here in Turkey, and in response to the investment opportunities, we follow the advice of Peter Drucker, who said the best way to predict the future is to create it. We have incentive packages for investments. And believe it or not, 85% of all global investments that poured into Turkey last year came from EU member states. 65% of the tourists that we entertain in this country, and we gain around 30 billion euros come from EU, 50% of our exports to EU. So the butterfly effect is more evident than ever. Mm -hmm. Nobody has the luxury to say, this is a European problem, I don't care. No, this is an international problem, and we all have to look at it and try to find solutions together. Daniel, do you want to comment at all on either of these points or on the, uh, the uh, enlargement question? I mean, do you think there is any appetite at the moment within the EU for enlargement. Even, even the Brits, who've traditionally been very pro-enlargement at a popular level, actually has become, if you look at most polling, one of the most anti-EU enlargement uh, of all EU members. H how do you see this? Is this a separate debate at the moment? Well, this is actually the strength of the EU. Uh, there's very little appetite for further enlargement, but it's actually happening with Croatia these days. Uh, because the EU has a certain inertia. The machine works, it set itself a goal with Croatia, it worked on it for 15 years with endless grind, and people think it will never get there. In the end, it usually does get there. <laughs> so I'm pretty certain that there will be further enlargements, and the new countries, of course, will benefit uh, financially, but that's not the main concern. Uh, the main concern is that they can actually get up to the standards uh, uh, that the EU is setting for itself. And the dietitian is becoming more and more, uh, let's say, uh, hard with himself. Yeah. So he's expecting the people who join to be also better performing. And uh, that process is ongoing. It's not much noticed by the people in Europe. 
but it's noticed by the people who want to join, yeah. except, of course, for those the bigger ones, uh, where the people in Europe do notice, and that's a problem with Turkey. Exactly. The smaller guys can just slip in under the radar screen. Turkey is just too big and too important uh, to be getting the treatment. It's the danger of being a strategic country. Uh, President Yanukovych, um, interesting question that was posed to you about uh, either or. Is there a choice at the moment for, for Ukraine, especially given the position that the EU has taken vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, Timoshenko imprisonment? Thank you. Well, if you look at the geographical position of Ukraine, it is between two big conglomerates between the European Union and, the Rus and Russia. If we look at the trade turnover, the European Union has 26% of the trade turnover with the Ukraine and uh, to Russia goes 29%. Other CIS countries, uh, of 9%, and uh, by the way, Turkey takes 9% of the trade turnover. The only, Tur only Turkey, this is our uh, one of the biggest uh, trade partners. And uh, that is why Ukraine, having its national interest, uh, should take into consideration all these factors. But nevertheless, our strategic decision was made uh, either by my political force that I have been cheering and uh, where I worked for more than 15 years. The first program was the program of my party and uh, at the basis of the program there was written the accession of Ukraine to the European Union and that is the European integration. Time has passed, and uh, for more than 20 years now, Ukraine is an independent state. And uh, around this fact, uh, the talk is all about uh, where Ukraine is now. Ukraine, first of all, must be a reliable bridge between Europe and Russia. We don't have to make problems. Oh, on the contrary, we need to establish conditions and uh, terms for the movement of goods and uh, finances. Ukraine is economically developed country and it is beneficial either to Europe or to Russia as well as it is profitable for us uh, that our partners are fine. And that is why when we are talking about the place of Ukraine on the uh, political world map, I should say that the country is in Europe and it is a natural movement, the European movement, which is intrinsic with Ukraine, but uh, today we are closely following the situation with uh, the economic unification and uh, the customs union. It has existed f only for one year, and it is difficult today to say what the situation would be there. And uh, by the way, Ukraine is an observer in the Eurasian community. We are observers, as well as other CIS countries. We are closely following, and it is up to us to think how under new conditions to move forward when the customs union is in place and then we will have to think how to build relations with them. The trade turnover which exceeds 30 uh, percent, uh, well, uh, it makes us to be very, very pragmatic on the matter and uh, that is why we do not change, change our priorities. We keep a close watch and uh, today, I admit, we have the program we are working with, and uh, I mean the program on European integration. We have the agenda of approximation of the Ukrainian legislation to the European one, as I have mentioned before, on every standard 
Center is the Council of Europe that uh, we have obligations and commitments before, and we are implementing this program to fully uh, fulfill all our commitments and obligations, and this is our duty. I heard you say that you will have to be very pragmatic, but that your country is in Europe. And um, I don't know, I'm going to balance between those two. We literally only have four minutes left, and I have three. Oh, no, no, don't. Now everyone's putting their hands up. Um, so I'm not going to be able to take everyone's hands. I'm going to go with the three hands I saw go first. And you have to ask a very quick question. I'll give my panel a last chance, but we must finish in very little time. Uh, sorry, there was a lady here in the front row. Yes, well, no, no, maybe not anymore. Yes, please. Yep. And here. Okay. My name is Magdalena Kunova, and I'm president of European Policy Center, uh, general think tank in Brussels, and former commissioner in Barroso I on uh, consumer policy. So uh, if I'm to choose the only one topic, it would be about uh, internal market and growth. Uh, most of you gentlemen quite rightly said that uh, we are short in delivering from the internal market. There is hardly a presidency without putting in the core internal market. Just remember the, the uh, Czech presidency, uh, the slogan was uh, Europe without barriers. And where we are now? Uh, where is the service directive? Where is uh, even uh, European consumer policy? We are into 27 mini markets. So in short, my question is, uh, could some of the countries swallow up uh, the idea of uh, more federal Europe because of the internal market, not, not as the opposite of it? And just a small remark to, uh, to, to, to our uh, Turkish speaker, Mr. Minister, I'm, I was chief negotiator for Bulgaria for a good nine years. Twelve countries entered with the obligation to become members of Euro area, so be vigilant. <laughs> Question here at the front, very quickly. Microphone here, please. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much to all the panelists. And my question is to the minister from uh, Turkey, Mr. Vajis. Uh, my name is Florence Eid. I'm uh, the CEO of uh, Arabia Monitor, a research firm that focuses on the Arab countries. As part of the work we do, we've been watching carefully the initiative by uh, the Gulf states to form a union. This is a project that's been underway for a while. It's recently been accelerated, and it has recently included an invitation to Jordan and Morocco to join the Gulf Cooperation Council. Uh, independently of the invitation to, the, to new members, potential members, uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts on the GCC common market project and, and perhaps the creation of a common currency. Uh, I'm sure you've given some thought over the past few years on the pros and cons of forming and joining uh, a union. Uh, and if down the line one were to envisage uh, the uh, materialization of the invitation to countries like Jordan, Morocco to join the union and perhaps become an even larger union, this union would be at your doorstep. And given uh, Turkey's uh, role in the Middle East, I wonder if you have thoughts on that. That's a provocative question. And last question here at the front. I'm sorry for all those other people who put their hands up. Last question here. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> Salman Rasul, Afghanistan Foreign Minister. My question goes to my European colleague. Um, Turkey is uh, a regional power, uh, economically, uh, politically, and strategically. Uh, Turkey has very strong relation with the Middle East, but also with Central Asian countries and South Asia countries. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, Turkey being part of the European Union in longer term will be a great assess for the European Union. Uh, the way that uh, Turkey has this relation will be very beneficial for the future of uh, European Union, especially after 2025, which the world power will be in question. And the question will say the same for Ukraine, which will be in the longer term an asset for the European Union. That's my question. Thank you. Well, look, we've got three broad issues here. I don't expect them all to be covered, but let me just give each of our speakers a chance just to say one sentence just to close this off. Um, and uh, let me run in reverse order. Daniel, I'm going to start with you because you're going to be very succinct. And uh, any of the issues you'd like to pick up, there's obviously the question about the internal market. But any last comment you'd like to share with us? The internal market always moves more slowly uh, than business people want but it moves. 
It has moved always, and I think it will continue to move. So over the next 20 years, we'll see a much more integrated uh, internal market. At the same time, we also see, I think, a eurozone, which will be much slimmer in terms of its public finances, therefore more agile, and in the end, therefore stronger. So you think the eurozone will still have 15 to 17 members then in 12 months from now? Um, the number of members, I think, is, is secondary. Uh, but I think by the year 2020, it will have more than 20 members. That's an answer. You heard it here. Exactly. No, it's a good point. After 2020, you said more than 20 members. Okay. Let me, l let me come this way. Stick with the EU for a second uh, within it. Vittorio Grilli, any last comments you'd like to make? Either, I think this question really to you, this value of Turkey as a member of the EU, this is not really a question to Minister Baj, more a question perhaps to you, sitting inside one of the governments that needs to make this call? Well, you know, on, on Turkey, Italy has always been a great supporter. Uh, and uh, so uh, we certainly think that it would be a great value added uh, to um, the European Union. Um, more in general, maybe, uh, which is also to do with the internal market and so on. I think but uh, on the euro area, uh, some country maybe felt that uh, euro monetary union was uh, a happy ending of a 50 years journey and they didn't realize instead there was a, the beginning of a new stage and actually they didn't realize that the monetary union meant that we put a lot of things together and actually we switched gear and switching gear means that I agree with uh, Daniel that uh, internal market uh, progresses slowly but progresses and I think unfortunately monetary union I, I think fortunately meant we switch gear. So the velocity, the speed with which uh, further integration happens has to uh, basically increase. Uh, that, I think, is one of the main yeah, problems and main challenges. Thank you. Last comment, Mike, for you. On yeah. this very very quickly, my conclusion is the European Union needs Turkey more than Turkey needs the European Union. <laughs> Don't tell them that. Oh, too late. <laughs> <laughs> Imin Baj, a uh, question to you on, uh, on that. GCC, does that hold siren voices for you? Well, first of all, as far as the internal markets are concerned, I think it's time to internalize the international markets. Enlargement is like riding a bicycle. If you stop, you might fall. I think the solution is to go beyond the borders and have a longer vision of expansion. As far as the GCC getting stronger, we would welcome it. We would like to see all of our neighbors in the neighborhood live even more prosperous than they do, with standards to make sure that the people live in higher standards. That's why we're trying to join the EU, despite all the difficulties. And as far as joining the Eurozone, not the EU, EU I'm Turkey's chief negotiator, Madam Commissioner. If you're willing to negotiate the terms, let's sit and <laughs> negotiate. As many people have said, though, Mr. Baj, it's, it's never a negotiation joining the EU. It's just how long it takes to accept all the nasty things that are being thrown in your direction, it's or good things. Change, it's time to change some of the rules as well. There you go. Okay. We Unanimity have... is the reason for the crisis we have at hand. And I think we should start by changing that rule. The unanimity has forced Europe to a crisis. It's time to really yeah. look at the bigger picture. That's an interesting point. That might be a different speed year. President Yanukovych, you I am convinced that uh, the enlargement process is a good prospect. And we are in favor of the prospect, to have the prospect both for Ukraine and Europe. And uh, this stage is not a simple one, but possibly this will uh, benefit uh, both Europe and Ukraine, the pause I mean, in relations, and we will make the full use of this pause, and we will be building the Euro Europe in Ukraine. So succinct at the end. Uh, if I'm going to take one takeaway from this, as we're always meant to have these at the World Economic Forum, I think it was the comment you just made, Vittorio Grilli, about the Eurozone, joining the Euro has been a switch of gears. 
literally a switch of gears and velocity. And I think most or many Eurozone members had not appreciated that shift and that change. The question then comes to Daniel's point. Even if one or two people drop off at this higher speed or can't quite achieve the balance, the likelihood they'll try and get on again uh, and actually continue this process of growth of the EU and deepening of it, I think that's a more likely outcome in the future than one of disintegration. I'd put my money on, on a little more integration and a little more enlargement in the long term than the opposite. But please give a strong hand to all of our speakers here. Thank you very much.